My name is Michal Ledwith. Michal is the Irish language form of Michael. I enrolled as a student for the Catholic priesthood in 1960 at Maynooth College in Ireland, which was the major seminary for the whole of Ireland, as, as well as being a college of the National University of Ireland and a pontifical university. A pontifical university is a university which has its charter from the Pope, which is the way most of the original and ancient universities in Europe began. I was born in County Wexford in Ireland in 1942. And I was, like many young men of my time, who were idealistic and who wanted to find the answers to the great questions about life and human destiny, the questions that perplexed everyone, even agnostics and atheists. And I set out to find in the best way available to me at that time what the answers to those questions might be. And that's how I began my search in earnest in 1960. I began to study for a degree of Bachelor of Arts of the National University of Ireland. Then I obtained a Bachelor of Philosophy degree at the Pontifical University in Maynooth. Now, I was very fortunate at that time in my life to have had a very rare privilege, and that was the chance to spend a long time without interruption at the study of various subjects. Physics, chemistry, law, history, literature, as well as my main studies of interest in philosophy and theology. And after several bachelor's and licentiate degrees, I culminated my 11 or 12 years of university level study with a doctorate in theology. I was appointed onto the staff of the university almost immediately as a lecturer. And four or five years later, I became a professor of dogmatic or systematic theology. Then subsequently, I became dean of the faculty, head of department, registrar of the university, and finally vice president in 1980. Five years later, I was appointed president of Maynooth College for a 10-year term, which I completed in 1994. It was a time of enormous expansion for the college, during which the student enrollment increased 300%, with corresponding demands for staff increases, lecture hall, scientific laboratory needs, and student residences, all of which were built in my time. I had a very busy life as an academic and as an administrator. I became chairman of the Committee of the Heads of the Irish Universities, and I was a member of the Governing Bureau of the Conference of the Universities of Europe, the CRE. But all throughout that time, despite how busy I was in terms of teaching and administration, I continued this search for the answers to the great questions because I still had no real definitive answers. Now in 1980, a very significant thing occurred. I was appointed a member of a small elite group of theologians from all over the world called the International Theological Commission. It was charged with advising the Holy See and the Pope on theological matters. And I was to occupy that position for three separate terms, totaling 17 years in all. 
I took that position very seriously. And for almost all of that time, the head of the commission was the present Pope, Benedict XVI, who was then Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. I was very conscious that the Pope we were advising, Pope John Paul II, had an enormous responsibility. More than one billion Catholics in the world hung on his every word. And his word was also deeply respected by many other religious groups, Christian and non-Christian. And if I had been in Pope John Paul's position, I imagine that I would not have slept too well most nights because I would be concerned to make sure that my guidance and my message was the truth and accurately reflected what Jesus had taught. I mean, what would be the consequences for guiding people in inaccurate or erroneous directions in following the message of Jesus? Now, I did my best to fill that role I had in so far as my humble capacity was able. I wanted to make sure that the very best of theology, the most accurate and the most profound, was available in terms of the advice we gave. And on three occasions over those 17 years, I was the author personally of the document which the Commission produced. But I still found, despite the fact that some of the most legendary theologians of my student days served with me on that International Commission, they were men of incredible learning, unbelievable knowledge famed in their field all across the world. But despite the fact that I had access on a daily basis to them, despite the fact that I had opened to me the best libraries in the universities of Europe and the best religious libraries all over Europe and elsewhere, including the Vatican libraries, there were still those gaps remaining which showed me that the Jesus of history was not the Jesus that I saw hidden behind so many of the statements in the Gospels. And obviously, I was deeply perturbed by that. Now, one statement in particular perturbed me most of all. Jesus said in the Gospel of St. John that if we followed his teachings that we would do all the works by which St. John mentioned miracles. We would do all the works that Jesus did, and greater than these would we do. Now, the point is valid, even if Jesus only spoke of one miracle. We should all be able to do at least one miracle if we follow his teachings. But when I looked around me at the 20,000 churches and denominations that carry the Christian label today, where is the evidence that this is taking place? Indeed, when I look outside of Christianity, I'm driven to the conclusion from my own personal research that none of the major religions have ever lived up to the promises that their founders made. Now, this was a really serious situation for me. And I felt coming as an intensely devoted son of the Christian tradition that there was a dire need for a deeper examination of what Jesus was and what Jesus did than was commonly retailed from the lecture hall and the pulpits all across the Christian world. 
Now, when you look at the four Gospels of the New Testament, the canonical New Testament, and also some of the other Gospels that never made it into the New Testament for obvious reasons, as we will see later. When you do that, I suppose the first thing that a sincere seeker will notice is that we hear of Jesus being born at Bethlehem, which covers a couple of days of his life. We hear that shepherds, the outcasts of Jewish society, come to visit him. We hear of the Magi coming to do him honor. The two most despised classes in the mind of an Orthodox Jew were the Magi were Babylonian astrologers, which every God-fearing Jew would abhor and shun. So we hear of those two days or a few days around his birth. We hear of him fleeing into Egypt to escape the persecution of King Herod. We hear he came back from Egypt. We are not told when. And then there's a big gap. We don't hear another word from whenever he came back from Egypt until he is 12 years old in the temple. And after that, there is an even greater gap, this time of 18 years, about which we are told nothing in the New Testament except that he went down to Nazareth and the Christian tradition has surmised that he may have worked as a carpenter. Well, if he could accomplish what he did, after that we should all become carpenters straight away. That 18-year gap is more than half of his entire lifetime. Now, all of my life I had been searching for answers to these great questions about where we came from, what precedes life here on this earth, and what we should do while we're here, and what may we expect after death. I knew that most of the people to whom I had talked and ministered to in all of my years in the Catholic ministry were thirsting for answers to those same questions in their own way. And I had looked at all of the known sources that were available to me. And as I told you, I was a student of these sources, thankfully, for many, many years. But I had always found great gaps, great areas where there was nothing to account for or to vouch for what I was supposed to believe in. These are not airy-fairy statements. I'm talking in particular about issues, for example, such as everyone ponders, what may I look forward to when I draw my last breath? I found that many of these images which some of the main religions produce are really mawkish and sentimental with no real content. And it's obvious why most of the religions today no longer speak about what awaits us after death at all because I think they are ashamed to do so in that language and terminology. It's no longer their intellect that causes them to have problems. It's basically a matter of their taste now. As the great French philosopher that I studied long ago, Maurice Blondel, said so well. So it was at that stage in my searches, having read and examined and contemplated most of what was readily available in the Western world and in the Eastern world, and having found great gaps in it all, which I couldn't fill anywhere, no matter where I looked. And at that point, I found a very sophisticated body of teaching which came from Ramtha and his school of ancient wisdom, Ramtha's quintessential school of the mind. 
And here I found, in a very simple form, answers to some of the most complex and major questions to which hitherto I had found no response to. And indeed, I had almost abandoned hope of ever finding any adequate answers to them. I think a lot of people are in that same position today. They're distinctly uneasy and unhappy with what's presented to them for belief, but they don't know of anything better. And like Blaise Pascal, another great French philosopher, they think it's safer to believe than not to. So for the past decade or more, in these teachings of Ramtha, I discovered deeper and deeper depths. And I devoted my life to the study of these teachings in order to better understand not alone where I was going, what I was supposed to be doing with my life, what counted in the sight of God, what does not count, and what can I expect after death, but also I understood what exciting possibilities that are available for every human person in this life to avail of while they are here in this incarnation. That is the joy and the power and the liberation and freedom and sovereignty which Jesus promised, but which is unfortunately so sadly outside of the ability of religions to deliver. Now, given the roles that I have had and the positions I have held, I suppose it's laboring the obvious to say that not everyone is happy with the things I am saying and the things I am doing now. But those teachings of Ramtha gave a new direction and depth to a lifetime that I had dedicated to the study of these questions. And they guided me into unfamiliar and exciting channels. It endowed my entire life and understanding with a depth and a meaning which they would otherwise never have had. For the moment, let's now look at the other great gap in the life history of Jesus, his time in Egypt. Now, Egypt was well past its era of greatness when Jesus lived, but it was still an extremely interesting place, esoterically, mystically, spiritually. Along the Nile, there was a series of great temples, and each temple was dedicated to the work of what we in modern times would call the seven seals, or the seven chakras, as the New Age terms it. This work consisted in addressing the issues of each of the seals in a progressive way. Now, the base seal bottom seal, which is in the genital area, deals with issues related to procreation. The second seal, located in the mid-abdomen region, deals with the issues of victimization, of pain, suffering. If only they hadn't done this to me, etc. The third seal is in the solar plexus region, it's the seal of power, the seal of tyrants when it's abused. But of course victims need tyrants and tyrants need victims. So these two temperaments have a nice symbiotic relationship going on. So coming back to the temples in Egypt, the second temple is the easiest to describe in a short space of time. In fact, it was a double temple. 
There was a shrine of the crocodile god, very sacred in Egypt, Sobek, symbol of the lower self. Right beside another shrine for the god Horus, who was the symbol of the higher self. So these two temples represented the lower and higher self respectively. And when the initiates on this path, and remember they were always very few, when they had been fully instructed, trained and tested, they were brought into this initiation blindfolded. They were brought to the pool in the temple of the god Sobek, the crocodile god. Then they were told to take off their blindfolds and jump into the water. Of course, it should come as no surprise to anyone to find crocodiles in a pool inside the temple of the crocodile god. And that was exactly the scene that greeted the new initiates when they took off their blindfolds. Now, people who engage the discipline half-heartedly, despite all their training, people who had not benefited from their teaching and their experiences would probably jump in reluctantly. They had to jump in because if they didn't, then they were banned from the great work, adventure, along those great temples of the Nile, and they would never be invited back again in this lifetime. So it was now or never. So even though they might have been frightened to see the crocodiles in the water, and even though they may have forgotten their teachings, they still jumped in, even though half-heartedly. So they jumped in, stayed on the surface, and tried to splash around, warding off the crocodiles. Now that is most assuredly not a career move in a crocodile pool. So most of those initiates perished there and then. It was a neat system, clean, no paperwork to mop up afterwards. But the ones that dove in wholeheartedly and swam right down to the bottom of the pool found that there was a 12-foot-long tunnel at the bottom. It was in complete darkness. But if they trusted and went into the darkness through this pool tunnel, they found it led to another pool. And when they came up to the surface in the adjacent pool, which is in the Temple of Horus next door, they found that the pool was free of crocodiles, and that by overcoming their fears for self-preservation in the pool of Sobek, they had emerged into the pool of the higher self and had passed the test. They were eligible to move on to the next stage in their journey. So what did that initiation symbolize? It symbolized the transition from the unconscious fears that keep us so imperiled, that keep us marooned spiritually, and that do not allow us to make progress. All of these temples were in different ways about the work of overcoming those things that keep us blocked. That has always been the great journey. Sometimes the spiritual path has strayed close to the path of the great work. Sometimes the spiritual path has strayed far from it, as has Christianity today. But the essence of the ministry and the teaching of Jesus was exactly aligned upon the path of the great work. However, let's look forward to the sixth temple which was at the Great Pyramid of Giza and centered on the chamber that we now call the King's Chamber, but which is actually the temple of the goddess Nu, the goddess of the earth. The center 
of the ceremonial there focused on the great stone sarcophagus which is located in that temple of the goddess Nuth. The initiates were training for freedom from the greatest fears that block us, that keep us back from our spiritual evolution. And the greatest of all these fears according to the ancients and to the mystery schools that follow them, the greatest of all these fears was the fear of death. Every other fear, they said, is rooted in that fear. So if, if we can remove the fear of death, all the other fears will fall away. And the greatest block to our spiritual progress is gone. So at Giza, and remember the initiation was not always performed within the Great Pyramid, but at Giza, the initiation consisted in the confrontation of death in a symbolic way. The initiate was brought in blindfolded and laid in the sarcophagus. He or she did not have any idea of what was going to happen and most likely didn't even know beforehand that there was a sarcophagus. The candidates were placed lying inside it in silence and the great stone lid was then placed on top. The initiates didn't know, of course, if they're going to be there for an hour, a month, a year, or whether this was forever. They didn't know if there was ventilation in the sarcophagus, which there was. Most people going through that discipline lost their reason because of acute claustrophobia, despite all their teachings and instructions. You know, for the first while it was okay. But then they began to wonder if they could get out. And once they started to lift up their hands to see if they could establish how far the walls of this little chamber went and to see if they could lift off the lid, of course, then you've lost it. But if they were able to overcome all those instincts of self-preservation and victimization. If they could come through it and hold their sanity for three days and three nights, which was the required period, while the soul went on its journey and had its own tests, then after that three days and three nights period, which should be very familiar from the accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, then at the end of the period they would be transformed because within the neural nets of the brain and all the windings and chemical circuits that drive our physical body the lapse of that period of time would have altered the circuits and the physical basis of fear would have been exorcised totally out of them and then they were ready for a really significant advancement on the path of the great work. So they qualified for advancement to the temple of the seventh seal at Heliopolis. And at Heliopolis they envisaged an advanced stage of what had taken place at Giza. The great belief of the priests of Heliopolis was that you could, if sufficiently advanced, raise your own body to life again through the power of your spirit. They had reserved in their Holy of Holies at Heliopolis a pedestal on the left-hand side of the sanctuary. That pedestal nowadays is buried under a thick layer of dust about six inches deep and is totally unknown, but I myself have seen it. It was reserved for the first person who would prove their belief at Heliopolis that you could raise your own body from the dead through the power of your spirit. I noticed with interest that the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ tells us that Jesus did come to Heliopolis after his mission in the Holy Land and was honored by the priests there. Now I wonder at this stage, are there some little bells beginning to ring in your minds?
Are we beginning to get a very different understanding, maybe even the first hints of a very different understanding of what Jesus really was about during his public ministry? Remember that he had got this teaching in Egypt in his early years. Other sources say he was at Heliopolis on his way back from India before he embarked on his mission in the Holy Land. I suppose it was a sort of finishing school. He went to Israel with this belief at the forefront of his mind that the supreme test of human evolution and accomplishment was to have so brought forth the power of the Spirit in your life that it could function independently of the body. This would show to all the people of the world that the great primordial fear, death, in reality was nothing. And as both the book of Genesis and St. Paul in the epistle to the Romans say, death was never meant to be a natural thing. Now this begins to give us a very different picture of what Jesus was about in the Holy Land in those three years of his public ministry. You know, it wasn't that he just happened to fall foul of the public authorities of the time and that this brought him to his death. And somehow God raised him up because Jesus didn't deserve to die. That's not really the facts of the situation. That's a hamburger universe way of looking at reality. No, Jesus came into the Holy Land with a very, very powerful ideal in mind. He was on his way to an initiation of the most sublime kind. He was never meant to be a suffering savior to die for our sins. He was on to something much, much greater for himself and for us. And of course, as Jesus always said, whatever I can do, you too can do. Can you imagine the potentials for us all if death and sickness and all the fears that are rooted in the fear of death were no longer of any validity in our lives? What a change that would bring to the world and its limited ideas. So we begin to get a suspicion from those hidden years of Jesus that there was an awful lot more going on in what he did and said and taught and went through than the popular sanitized versions of his ministry and teaching as perpetrated by the religions allow us to believe today. An awful lot more was going on. An awful lot more powerful stuff was being perpetrated. An awful lot of more unimaginable promise for you and me today was being accomplished. Let's take a few of the symbols which he took from Egypt. Some of the most intriguing elements that are associated with the ministry of Jesus in the Holy Land. Let's take baptism. First sacrament of the Christian Church, which it is. But this is a very ancient ceremony. It goes back thousands upon thousands of years in the mists of antiquity. And it's based on the belief that water was the primeval substance from which everything else came. I suppose scientifically today we have to acknowledge that that's not far off the mark. So in this ceremony, after your instruction and preparation, you are brought to a pool of water and you are submerged in the water. What did that symbolize? It symbolized, in our modern terms, that you were being recycled, that you were going back into the primeval substance, water, from which you had originally emerged, and then you were raised up, and you were going to be raised up to an entirely new level of life. This is what the born-again Christians have at the root of their belief. It's an entirely new form of life that's symbolized in this ritual. Let's take another major Christian element, 
Ask where did that come from? The sacred meal of the Eucharist, the Last Supper which Jesus ate with his disciples in the upper room on the night before he was arrested. This ceremony also goes back thousands upon thousands of years to the great mystery schools. And the elements that are in the Eucharist symbolize the deepest elements about human nature and its potentials for you and me. In the ancient schools, the element of that meal were very, very sacred. The wine symbolized the spirit, which came directly from the Creator. The bread symbolized the body of the physical incarnation. And the water which was added to the wine symbolized the soul, which was the recorder of the experiences of the incarnation. Now here we're back again to our old friend quantum physics. We know from quantum physics that whatever we accept and believe truly, deeply and profoundly, and what we focus on, we know that that's going to be magnetized into our life, infallibly. The Eucharist, or this sacred meal of the bread and wine and water, was the profound ceremony destined to unify this spirit, this soul and this body, and to transmute it exactly as Jesus taught. All of the seven sacraments, in fact, were profound rites of initiation in the ways in which they were first performed. Are they ever performed in this way now? Unfortunately, almost never. Because the focus is most likely to be far too much on getting the parking lot emptied of cars from the first congregation before the next congregation arrives for the following mass or religious service. You cannot do these rites with the power they had in that kind of a setting today. But it suffices to know that there was an awful lot more going on in those ceremonies and rituals that comes from the time of Jesus than perhaps we ever expected. And if they're not as powerful today as they then were, it's because we have had to squash them into time frames and molds that they don't find congenial. Now let's take another example. The cross itself. The cross has now become identified with Christianity. It's the very symbol of Jesus himself today. But of course the cross is far more ancient than Christianity. It was part of the tradition of the mystery schools. What did it symbolize at that time? It symbolized the harmony of the vertical and the horizontal, of the transcendent with the imminent, of the realms beyond with the realms here and now on this plane. The symbol of the crucifix in traditional Christianity, and remember the crucifix is not the cross, the crucifix recalls the passion and the death of Jesus. It was not by any means at the heart of what he was about. So, why have we come to venerate this symbol of an agonizing death? Venerating the crucifix is the same thing as if we today venerated an electric chair as a symbol of execution. Placing its representation on our altars or hanging it on chains around our neck. It was the Emperor Justinian II who decreed only in the year 692 that the crucifix should replace the bare cross, which was in fact a much more accurate representation of the ancient faith coming from Jesus and from long before. 
The cross, in fact, is one of the most ancient and universal of all religious symbols, long predating Christianity, common and widespread. Now in archaeological remains across the ancient Near East, on down into India, indeed all across the world, archaeologists have unearthed the depictions of the cross in all sorts of cultures. What did it symbolize in those ancient cultures? It certainly didn't symbolize an execution, a crucifixion, because there was no such thing to symbolize in most of those cultures. It symbolized the harmonization of the vertical and the horizontal, the harmonization of the planes beyond this material one and this physical plane down here. It signified the transcendent and the imminent. In other words, it signified God-man and God-woman realized in this human incarnation. It indicated when a state of complete harmony had taken possession of all the being of a living person. So in its ancient forms, the cross was a symbol of spirit incarnated into matter. It represents a key to how the entire universe works. We are dabbling in matter, but are rooted in realms far beyond this one. It's no wonder that in mathematics, the cross became the symbol of addition, or when placed at an angle, that it became the sign of multiplication or progressive forward movement. In paganism and in early Christianity, the cross always symbolized life, never death, which is why early Christianity used it as its symbol, a cross, sometimes with a lamb placed against the cross, but never a crucifix. That is a cross bearing the body of Jesus crucified on it. In fact, one can note that the first depiction of a God crucified on a cross was the depiction of Orpheus from the third century before Christ. But sad to say, for a very large part of the world's population today, the central religious symbol is a person impaled in agony on that instrument of torture. It's little wonder that such a system should foster the belief that suffering is inevitable or even desirable and good. And horror of horrors, that it could be in some warped way seen as pleasing to God and thus allow us to become so indifferent to suffering among the masses of humanity. An empty cross symbolizes the descent of spirit into flesh and celebrates the evolution of that life back into its return. The crucifix, by contrast, only idealizes suffering and death, an attitude which ultimately has to be said is not of God. It would be hard to find another symbol that misrepresents the teaching of Jesus to the same degree that the crucifix does. And it's a travesty that it has now become the central symbol of his mission. Now we sometimes find in these archaeological remains the representation of a serpent crucified on the bare cross a cross which has arms of equal length to symbolize harmony. It's common also in illustrations in the hermetic and esoteric traditions. Now what did the crucified serpent symbolize? Well, the serpent symbolizes what we nowadays in the West would call the Kundalini force, the life force that circulates 
through the human being. What does the crucifixion of that life force on the cross of harmony represent? Well, it's obvious that it indicates we've brought our life force into harmony, into regulation, into control, and that we have done so without repression, but through owning it. We have conquered ourselves. However, the plot thickens even further when we realize the age at which this occurred in the life of Jesus. In ancient times, as Ramta has taught, puberty extended out to the age of 32 years. By that time, especially in ancient times, you had married and raised a family. You had worked through all of your stuff. You were ready to move on. You were ready to move on to a much more exalted occupation. By the age of 33, then you were ready to take on in earnest the great work, the great work of human evolution, spiritually and materially. So the crucifixion of the Kundalini force on the cross at the age of 33 freed you now for an entirely different form of endeavor. Now we're beginning to see a totally different dimension to his passion and to his death, more than the movie makers at Hollywood have ever suspected. And especially when you contemplate the precise time of year when all this occurred. It's striking how many major festivals in all cultures are gathered around the precise day on which this event occurred in the life of Jesus. Obviously, we have Passover in the Jewish tradition. We also have the great festival of the Iranian solar year, Nauruz. We have Maimuna in the Arab world. And of course, after the time of Jesus, we have Easter. Why are all these major festivals grouped around that precise particular time of year. What is this period? It's the spring equinox. Why should that be so special? The Gospel of Judas was discovered in the late 1970s and revealed to the world in April 2006. After extensive deterioration and restoration, of the single text known to survive. This document from the second part of the second century confirms the same message. Three days before Passover, Jesus asked Judas to hand him over to the authorities at a very precise time. It was deliberately planned. He was on a great initiation, which was all deliberately planned and timed to the last degree. Well, from the time of the spring equinox onwards into summer at the solstice, the sun is waxing more and more strongly into its full power. In ancient times, it was reckoned to be an enormously propitious time when the forces of nature were in favor of any new enterprise on which we'd embark, any new beginning, and especially anything to do with a new grade of life and growth and resurrection. We are advised as gardeners to plant when the moon is waxing, not waning. And the ancients advised us to embark on any major endeavor when the sun was waxing that is, from the equinox of the spring on into the summer solstice in June. The four great festivals of the ancient world, particularly among the Druids, were interspersed between the solstices and the equinoxes. Christianity has replaced all of these pagan festivals with religious equivalents. Now, 
You may argue that these symbols were common in the era and the time of Jesus. But let's look a little more closely how he integrated not only the sacred symbology and ritual, but also the teachings and the sayings gained during his times in Egypt and Asia, how he brought those into his ministry. Perhaps the most magnificent discourse of Jesus, in which he encapsulated his entire message, is what we now, nowadays call the Sermon on the Mount. It was the time when he had decided to irrevocably commit himself to the experience at Passover, which led to his death. The Sermon on the Mount as delivered by Jesus on that grassy hillside beside the Lake of Galilee does not have a single idea in it that is not paralleled in the Jewish Mishnah or the Talmud. Jesus' standing in the Old Testament tradition is widely accepted by all biblical scholars, of course, without any question. But what is not so widely accepted, if accepted at all, is how much Jesus also stands dead center in other traditions as well as that of Judaism, such as the traditions of the Hermetic books of Egypt. The very title of the seventh book of Hermes is his secret sermon on the Mount of Regeneration. We can look back at so many things. Francis of Assisi is credited with introducing the ox and the ass into the representation of the crib at Christmas time. Would it surprise you to know that in the Holy of Holies of the great temple at Karnak, there is a depiction of a birth in a stable with angels singing, shepherds visiting, and an ox and an ass? all of this 1,700 years before the birth of Jesus. All recognize that Jesus quotes the Old Testament figures in his teachings. Scholars have recognized all of the illusions of this kind that he makes. And if you open a modern version of the New Testament, you'll see at the bottom of every page lists of the Old Testament sources from which Jesus is quoting and which the audience of his day would have recognized instantly without any effort. But what is hardly ever recognized is how significantly the teachings of Jesus also parallel other teachings totally from outside the Jewish tradition, especially Eastern traditions. The teachings of the Buddha Gautama and of Christ Jesus were both world subverting. They both taught a way of life that had transformed themselves and which would also bring about a profound transformation in those who followed it. This way of life was far more important than just knowledge however important knowledge undoubtedly was as a basis. The similarity between Jesus and the Buddha lies mainly in this way, with a capital W, this system of behavior that they both, both advocated as central to everything. This way would open up one to an entirely new way of being, and the teachings only pointed towards that way. They were not the heart of the matter. There are enormous differences between the teachings of Jesus and the Buddha. Jesus was an ardent campaigner for social change in a way that the Buddha never was, in the sense that he stood in the true tradition of the prophets of Israel, who had all campaigned to their peril for deep social change. And yet the systems of teaching of Jesus and the Buddha show uncanny similarities. It's beyond doubt that the fact lends credibility to the view that Jesus lived in India and Tibet 
and came into contact with the Buddhist and Hindu teachings there. In a true sense, these are questions that a perceptive person would still be asking today, even if the scrolls discovered by Nicholas Nodovich and similar documents about the life of Jesus in the Far East had never existed or had never come to light. We would still have to ask those questions today because of the character of Jesus' teachings and how close they are to that of the Buddha. It was not the custom, of course, of Jesus normally to quote the Jewish prophets by name. And needless to say, he never quoted the Buddha by name either. But even if the Buddha by name is never quoted by Jesus, would it surprise you to know that some of the most famous parables of Jesus are also found in the writings of the Buddha some 550 years before? The famous parable of the sower, found in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, tells of how a sower cast his seed and how it fell on a range of different soils with very different results. The Buddha told it 500 years before. The parable of the treasure in the field is also found in the Buddha's writings. So is the admonition that though heaven and earth should pass away, his words would never pass away. The statement of Jesus about how easily we see the speck in our brother's eye and fail to see the beam in our own, which is in St. Luke chapter 6, is found also in the teachings of the Buddha. He says, the faults of others are easier to see than one's own. The faults of others are easily seen, but our own faults are hard to see. That's in the Udana Varga, section 27. The admonition of Jesus to do unto others as you would have them do to you is also found in the teachings of the Buddha. Jesus said that whoever looked on a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The Buddha said, commit no adultery. The law is broken by even looking at the wife of another man with lust in the mind. In Hindu, the Lord Krishna says, I am the letter A. I am the beginning and the end. While in the Christian book of Revelation, Jesus the Christ says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Both Krishna and Jesus tell their disciples that he will dwell with them and they in him. Jesus says in Luke's Gospel, If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Luke chapter 6. The Buddha gives exactly the same advice in the Hemima Nikaka, verse 21. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. The Buddha said, hatred does not ever cease in this world by hating, but by love. This is an eternal truth. Overcome anger by love. Overcome evil by good. Overcome the miser by giving. Overcome the liar by truth. And Jesus said, just as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. Matthew 25. While the Buddha says, if you do not tend one another, then who is there to tend you? Whoever would tend me should tend the sick. The image of the poorly built house is found in both. The emptiness of ritual washings to purify oneself is found in both. And both the Buddha and Jesus 
were accused of luxurious living because they never practiced a harsh asceticism. Because they knew that what needs to be disciplined in the human being is not the body, but the mind. So it makes no sense to punish the body. Other parables told by Jesus come not from the sayings of the Buddha, but from the Hindu traditions before the time of Jesus, which includes the statement of Jesus that if you had faith like a mustard seed, you could move mountains. Moving mountains is a lingua franca of the great mystery schools. Reminiscent of the wedding at Cana, the Buddha and his disciples were invited to a wedding, and instead of the food being consumed as the guests ate it, it actually grew in quantity and fed the multitude that eventually turned up at the feast. The story of the widow's might in Mark 12 is replicated in the teachings of the Buddha. In fact, it's replicated so closely that it would be almost impossible to maintain that both stories were independently created. Jesus often spoke disapprovingly of those who had a thirst for miracles, and so did the Buddha. Once when the Buddha met a yogi who had spent 25 years of intense concentration trying to learn how to walk on water with no tangible result, the Buddha asked him why he had wasted his time on such a small thing when all he needed was a small coin and the ferryman would have taken him across the river in his boat. Just as the saintly old man Simeon prophesied the birth of the Messiah and held Jesus in his arms as a babe, so the Buddha's birth is prophesied by the saintly old Asita. As Jesus was lost in the temple, and was found discoursing with the doctors, so the Buddha wandered away and was lost in contemplation before his family found him again. Both began to preach at the age of 30, and both had 12 disciples. Both called their first disciple when he was sitting under a fig tree. Both had a favorite disciple, and both had one who betrayed him. Need I go on? A.J. Edmonds, for instance, maintains that there are 112 parallels to the Buddhist teaching in the texts of the Christian Gospels. Was this an accident? From another perspective, there are uncanny similarities between the Catholic and the Buddhist and Hindu practices. The rosary, the veneration of relics, ascetical practices, the ceremony of baptism, the ceremony of confession of sins, the celibate clergy, etc. All of these are of Indian origin. There is an uncanny similarity between the fundamental Catholic practices and those of Tibetan Buddhism. The majestic prologue of the fourth gospel, the Gospel of John, begins with the statement, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What do the Vedas say? In the beginning was Brahman, with whom was Vak of the Word, and the Word was Brahman. A direct quotation from several centuries earlier. Do you still maintain it was impossible for Jesus to have lived in India? The fact of the matter is that most of the teachings of the masters of the early religions belonged first to the various mystery religions in oral form before they were ever committed to writing. In the light of all these similarities between their teachings, is it not tragic that the religions that grew up around their teachings became the heart of the great cultural divide that exists now between East and West, which is one of the foremost and most difficult obstacles that 
humanity is faced with trying to overcome today. So obviously, the person and the message of Jesus takes on an entirely different light when we take into account the evidence that comes from these two great missing periods in his life. We are told in the Gospels only of his infancy, of the incident at 12 years in the temple, and then the three final years of his ministry before his death. The vast majority of the life of Jesus is totally unknown in the Gospels. And when you come to reflect on that, isn't it quite an extraordinary fact that that should be? And you begin to wonder how much political correctness, how much mind control over the people was involved in trying to compress the grandeur of what Jesus truly was into the miserable molds in which we know him and into which he does not really fit at all. Scripture scholars, of course, will point out the, that the Gospels were concerned to give only the teachings of Jesus and not his biography. But one gets the sneaking suspicion that little as we know of his biographical details in the Gospels, perhaps we have been given precious little of his real teachings either. For it now begins to appear that all the New Testament contains are his public instructions. Now we are coming to suspect that the imitation of what Jesus did and the technology, and I call it that advisedly, the technology and the skill to accomplish it, while intended for us all eventually, were for the most part kept as closely guarded secrets which never passed into the Christian tradition. One of the most favoured titles the Christian tradition gave to Jesus was Lion of the Tribe of Judah. As that great writer of detective novels and plays on religious themes in the mid-20th century, Dorothy L. Sayers, once remarked to C.S. Lewis, I fear that the lion of the tribe of Judah has been declawed and converted into a household pet fit for one curates and maiden aunts. For instead of seeing a great and marvellous being who was on a magnificent journey of spiritual and human evolution of the most profound kind, we have been left with this picture only of the suffering Saviour who struggled up the hill of Calvary covered in blood only to be nailed to a cross. And all we can muster as a response to this is to beat our breasts in sorrow, repentance and guilt. And the deeper we bury ourselves into that guilt, the more, we are told, we become favoured in God's eyes. It's time for us to move beyond all of this. For the message of Jesus was never about earning rewards in the sight of God for good deeds or suffering the penalty of misdeeds. Rather, it was about accomplishing a profound inner transformation. And the keys to doing that, unfortunately, we lost. So, the heart of the matter then is not religion, but a technology. So now we have a very different understanding of what the life of Jesus really consisted in. We find for the vast majority of the years of his life there's nothing in the New Testament. He was in Egypt for a period of two to eight years. He set out for India at 12, reached there at 14, spent six years in the sacred cities, 
and then furthered his studies by going up into the mountains of the Himalayas, Nepal and Kashmir for another six years, studying with the great teachers. We are told he learned all the skills of healing and so forth for which these men in India were renowned. And when he was 26 years old, he came home again through Persia, through Persepolis and on into Turkey. And at the age of 30 years, he came to the boundaries of the Holy Land, where he was baptized in the Jordan by John after his preparation and embarked on that three-year culmination of his magnificent journey to become a God-man realized. And in that journey, he wanted to leave a path for us to follow him and to imitate him. Now that ministry looks very different, does it? When we understand some of the background of the symbols and the rituals and practices of the beliefs that came from the cultures and the teachers with whom he was immersed. Obviously, diehard orthodoxy has done its best to suppress and to eradicate all traces of any such facts. Therefore, they are few and far between. But when you compare them, few and far between, though they undoubtedly are, with what Jesus did, and how they give such a greater depth to everything that he thought and everything that he was, then you begin to feel, ah, at long last, I am on to some of the answers that I sought for so long. Because Jesus was on a great mission, a mission, in fact, which we are all obliged to be on of what we can do with this life, what I do with the years that are allotted to me. Is it just a matter of obeying X number of rules called commandments or dietary laws or whatever, and that I will get a heavenly reward in my bank account above the clouds with God? These things make no sense. And people are realizing that. They're voting with their feet. The pews are emptying. We know. And I always thought this myself when I was a professor of theology, that whatever we are here in this world to do is about becoming something, achieving a radical transformation in what I am and what I do. We are not here to be obedient or to follow a rigid line of commandments. We are here to bring about a monumental change in what we are. In the traditions which I researched as a theologian all those years, I could never find any explanation of how that could be accomplished until I found the teachings of Rantha. And then, of course, it all began to fall into place and make sense. And the life of Jesus now begins to make sense in the same way. The Church says Jesus was a man like all of us in all things but sin. I said at the start, quoting St. John, that if I were to speak on all the matters relating to Jesus, the whole world wouldn't be enough to contain the books that would need to be written. So I have focused here on issues that are of central importance from ev for every man and woman that walks this earth today. Important. Why? Because it throws light on how every person can achieve their own destiny for Jesus said, if you do what I teach you, you're going to do everything that I did, and more indeed than that will you do. How is it we've never heard or seen that very much in our instruction? Perhaps because the failure from non-performance is embarrassing. And the higher up you go in the organization, the greater the embarrassment at your failure to perform. The relevance of the real Jesus for us today is summed up in three major statements that he made. And any of us should take them absolutely seriously who are interested in discovering the real Jesus as opposed to the sanitized, homogenized, edited version that have turned him into a fable. A fable for adoration instead of an ideal to be imitated. I am reminded of the words of Pope Leo X, Giovanni de Medici, when he said, How well we know what a profitable superstition this fable of Christ has been for us, as he was quoted by John Bale. We are interested in the real Jesus, and the heart of his message is summed up 
in three great statements. The first one, he said, is it not written in your own law that you are all gods? The reaction of his hearers was to try to stone him for blasphemy, very similar to today. He said, why are you trying to stone me? I am merely quoting what's written in your own sacred scripture. It's in Psalm 82. The basic necessary realization is that we are all gods, but that we must bring it into realization. The technology to do that is what we need to learn, not obeying rituals, laws, and commandments that do none of this work for us. Now, people find a lot in common, a lot of problems with that. And I can understand it. Why? Because they are thinking of the God of the hamburger universe. The old man with the beard and the clouds with the telescope and the laptop watching everything we do and getting ready to punish us. Let's leave aside that image. Move to God the creator, the source of all the galaxies, the stars, and everything that exists on all the planes above this miserable one. Are we that God? Yes. Are we that God now? No. It involves a great process of personal growth, which is the one that Jesus embarked upon. So is it then at the, as a result of that process that we become the divine realized in man and woman? Yes. And that is when we are what Jesus said that we could become. You are all gods. Does that mean we're the creator God sitting on the cloud on the top floor of the hamburger universe? No. Does that mean we are God in the sense that Jesus is God? No, for Jesus has realized that divine life into himself, which is something we have yet to do. His second statement is written in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. When you pray for something, believe it is already yours, and then it will be so. Now, is that the way that you and I pray? No. In fact, I would bet we have never been taught to pray in this fashion. What we say instead is, Oh God, I'm a wretched, worthless, miserable, humble, useless sinner. I'm a worm. I'm a no man, a no woman. Please have mercy and have pity on me. Help me, please. We know from quantum physics that what we imagine, we actually are. We actually become. What we hold deeply and profoundly in our mind is magnetized to us infallibly. So if we pray in this way, is it any wonder that the world is in the way it is today? Jesus said, no, if you want to be something, if you want to have fabulous wealth, if you want to pray for radiant health, you must absolutely become fabulous wealth and radiant health first in your imagination. Otherwise, it cannot come to you. If you want to be healed, you must know that you are radiantly healthy even if your body is racked with pain. We've never been taught to manifest in that way, but that's the center of what he taught. It's how change occurs, and it's totally compatible with the insights of leading edge physics today. And his third statement is, if you do these things that I teach you, which I have just summarized, then you will do all the great works that I do, and greater indeed than these will you do. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, even Thomas, the twin brother of Jesus, is on record as doing far more miracles than Jesus himself. He raised 19 people from the dead. Jesus was not in a competition with us. He wanted to encourage us and to empower us to become like him. The world is startlingly without any evidence that this has ever taken place in the traditions that claim to follow his name. And so much of what he himself was has been lost and suppressed. The churches say that he was a man like us in all things but sin. Tremendous commotion has arisen over the fact that it's stated in the Da Vinci Code, for instance, that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Even more may arise when the relationship to John the Baptist is discussed. It was all part of a great dynastic struggle. The existence of his twin brother, Jude Thomas, has tried to be exorcised entirely from human history. There is a message even in that fact. When we remember that in the Middle Ages, half of the world's Christians owed their foundation in the faith to the teachings of Thomas, especially as expressed in the Gospel of Thomas, you realize what has happened 
because all traces of that Christianity, more than half of all the Christians in the world at that time, has been stamped out and it has been replaced by the Jesus of Yom Kippur. The suffering person who came to endure torment and death on the cross to appease the vengeance of the savage god of the hamburger universe. All of these intriguing elements that were raised by the Da Vinci Code, the marriage of Jesus, whether he had children, whether the royal lines of Europe descend from his daughter, these are all intriguing questions in their own right. What I've selected in this short talk is the quintessentially important aspect above all others, which has not yet, at least, hit the headlines. That is, how did he become a Christ and how can you and I imitated ourselves. Jesus said, if you do what I have taught you, you will do all the works I did, and greater than these will you do. John uses works in that technical sense as a term for miracles. Isn't it amazing? Jesus wants us to develop our own potential. He is not an idol to be worshipped. The church has taken him and divided him into two, Below the divine of division, there are aspects of him we are allowed to imitate. Love our neighbor, do good to those who hate you, turn the other cheek, etc. But above the line, there are aspects of Jesus that have been made taboo for you and me. They are off limits. We are not supposed to multiply loaves of bread and fish. We are not supposed to heal the sick at a touch. We are not supposed to raise the dead. We are not supposed to create our reality that faces us every day. Oh my God! But when we see Jesus in the wider perspective and take him out of the prison and the moles of Yom Kippur, we see that that is exactly what we were supposed to do because Jesus said whatever he did, we could do it and greater and further that we were supposed to do it. It's not a blasphemy. It's not an arrogance that deserves to be punished because the divine life is within us. The kingdom of heaven, as he repeatedly said, is within us all. We are the children of God and its heirs. So we have to get away from Yom Kippur to see the real Jesus, to realize he was never meant to be an idol for worship, but a magnificent ideal for our imitation, so that we can become what he showed us how to be. It's been well said, as I quoted at the start, that all the kings that ever reigned, and all the parliaments that ever sat, all the armies that ever marched, never changed the world as the life of this one man. He did not do that, I assure you, by being the suffering saviour of Yom Kippur. Don't you think it's time we started taking him seriously? And it can never be separated from his life and his ministry, his whole life in Egypt, India and Israel, and his life afterwards, which is another story. Part of the story is the story of his family, the story of Jude Thomas, who recorded the secret teachings which will form the subject of DVD in this series. And there is also the question of his relationship to Mary Magdalene, which will be also treated in a subsequent DVD. The secret teachings, as recorded by Thomas, show us that we are here not about placating the vengeful God of Yom Kippur, nor is it about gaining credits to be registered by God in the Book of Life. Rather, it's about knowledge of a technology which will permit to break through into this world of what we really are, the spirit of the higher planes of existence. This will break through into my body and into the world of matter so that we can then walk as Jesus did, as God-woman, God-man realized, and the whole of creation will respond to our will. There is hope. Because cultures are getting closer to each other, not just because of the increase in economic contacts all across the divides, or because of the increase in jet age travel, but because all cultures are beginning to rise to understand the commonality in all spiritual traditions. We are also coming to know that a destiny awaits us in this life way beyond anything the traditions ever gave us reason to hope for or expect. The issue really is not about whether Jesus travelled in India or Tibet or not, 
or whether he was influenced by the Buddha's teaching. The issue is that depending on the answers to these questions, we are faced with a very different understanding of what Christhood entails and whether it was something exclusive to one person or not. Can it be imitated today in the conventional picture of Jesus retailed in the Christian tradition? It cannot. If he travelled and learned in the East as a major part of his journey towards accomplishing this condition, then it appears that however exalted a state it is, However difficult it may be to attain, it is still something that is open to imitation by all of us. And it's something that he wished those who came after him would strive to attain. If that were accepted, what a change would come about on the face of the earth today? Rantha's teachings in concert with my lifelong study of many thousands of works in all the main European languages, both modern and ancient, have confirmed to me that the Christian religions do not, as they claim, carry the revelation of a message that was previously unknown. They have assumed their present form through the corruptions of a much more rare but previously existing wisdom that is as old as the foundations of the earth. Christianity could never concede that Jesus owed something to the Buddha or to the Hindus or to the Egyptians in his training. Because of the catastrophic implications that would have for the form Christianity had for most of its existence. For if he did owe them something in his training, then Jesus would have to be an ideal for our imitation and could never be seen as the one and only Son of God or God himself, who was parachuted down from the top floor of the hamburger universe to rescue us all as a suffering saviour. Jesus had nothing whatever to do with appeasing the anger of a savage God. Everything to do with a profound initiation. His triumph showed in a dramatic way what the power of spirit can accomplish in the human body. And it called on all human beings not to imitate the passion, but to bring forth that same spirit of miraculous power, joy, and freedom in their lives. This means that the teachings of Jesus in their pure form have never reached most of those for whom they were intended. And much of the heart of that message is irretrievably lost in the traditions of Christianity today.